Welcome to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy webinar series, which we kick off with the very first live session about what is the circular economy. And from businesses to governments to international institutions, many of the world's leading and largest organizations have announced targets and strategies to transition to the circular economy. But what is the circular economy? And how do you do it? And what does it mean to you? These are the questions that we will cover in the webinar today. And we want this live session to be as relevant to you as possible. So we will be covering the basics of the circular economy, but also we will try to cover and answer as many questions as possible. And we already have received some questions during your registration process. But at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can see the chat box and you can post your questions in the chat box throughout the session and we'll try to pick as many of them as possible. So, and also just to say that this session will be recorded and you will be able to re-listen to the recording on our YouTube channel afterwards. And my name is Ilma and I am part of the Foundation's learning team and it is the team that brought to you the newly published Learning Hub that you can find in our online space. And this Learning Hub covers a variety of topics around circular economy. And I'm joined today by my colleague Seb, who has been at the foundation for five years, and he's part of our comms team and managing our social media accounts. So I will be your host today, and I will be talking to Seb, and I will pick his wisdom and knowledge about circular economy. Great to be here today, Alma. Yes, it's great to have you, Seb. Um, so yes, you actually are a veteran host yourself, and you have hosted hundreds and hundreds of sessions during our Disruptive Innovation festival. And I bet you had to answer the question about what is the circular economy hundreds of times. So how would you describe it in 30 seconds? Whenever you say hundreds and hundreds of sessions or hundreds of times, it sounds sort of torturous, you know, but I still think like the <laughs> simplest way to describe the circular economy is to describe the way the economy predominantly works today, the linear economy, that we take something out of the ground, a material resource, we make something out of it, normally using a lot of energy, and ultimately that thing, that product, that, that whatever it is that was useful becomes waste. It's landfilled or, or incinerated. And the circular economy says um, that uh, let's turn that line into a circle. Let's design from the start out anything becoming waste or pollution. Let's try and keep these things in use at a high value use for as long as possible. And let's actually do more good and regenerate the natural systems that exist around us. So this linear model that we are part of today, how did we come to be here? Could you elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I think it's um, one of the, th there's a couple of things about that. One is that uh, it's important to remember that we haven't, it's not, hasn't existed forever, some of the things that we're seeing, um, or that we describe. Um, indeed, uh, we trace back the sort of linear economy to the Industrial Revolution, to the late 1600s, 1700s, and so on the various technological revolutions, the steam engine in the late 1600s, et cetera. Um, and suddenly all these technologies, you know, you know, imagine a world without machines. Imagine a world where you know, maybe you had your livestock mm -hmm. or um, and actually most of the energy was generated by people. Suddenly these technologies allowed us to create product, products at a massive scale um, and, uh, and, and at a pace and of change that we hadn't really seen before. Um, and it really relied, and, and actually it's worth saying that that had a massive benefit for a huge number of people, um, but it relied very much on the notion that materials are infinite, energy is infinite, and, uh, and you have plentiful access to really cheap labour. And so we designed a whole system around this sort of throughput uh, of that, which we really describes so take and make waste. And when I think about linear economy, I think the story that really stands out for me is the story of the light bulb which is about the fact that in, back in 1924, the light bulb manufacturers came together in Geneva to make a decision to reduce the lifespan of a light bulb to 1,000 hours. And what I find fascinating that at the time, the technology was already there to have the light bulbs to last for 2,500 hours. So that was actually the case, the first case of planned obsolescence, which is to reduce the lifespan of a product in order to bring more profits because the companies were afraid of losing the profits and getting out of businesses because people stopped buying the light bulbs. So, yes, so this linear economy is also driven by sales and consumption. And, yeah. and that, that story highlights incentives, right, that there's actually a system that exists. And that's why we call it an economy. That's why we don't just say that products are designed to become waste obsolescence. And actually, 
um, you know, you can think about the individual scale of a light bulb. Um, when you uh, amplify that out, it exists as a whole economy. So um, plastics, we know that um, or our research has shown that, uh, or predicted that by 2050 on the current course, there'll be more plastics in the ocean than fish. Of all the plastic that's produced, even with you know the 40 years of a recycling label existing on these products, uh, only 14% is even collected for recycling. About 2% is actually recycling the closed loop, sort of back into the same quality material again. And a third of it's escaping into our natural systems. Um, so it operates at a product level, but also you can really see it in these huge systems of materials that are flowing around our economy and around the planet. So if we take that one product, such as the light bulb, so if the linear economy is all about producing as many as possible, then selling as many as possible and making sure that they don't last long so people have to get rid of the non-working ones and buy the new ones, what would be the alternative in a circular economy? So there, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, and there's lots of alternatives. I think that uh, in the case of light, um, there's a famous example where um, Thomas Rao, an architect, he was... Uh, redesigning the offices of the company called Turn To in the Netherlands. Um, and he said, well, why, why would I buy light fittings and lights and pay for the electricity and manage this whole expensive infrastructure of life, this huge office, when all I really want is just a well-lit office? And so actually what they did is they entered into a contract with Philips Lighting, it was called Philips Lighting at the time, um, to just pay a fixed fee, a, a regular fee for the building to be lit and in, and for that fee Philips uh, provided everything the, the fittings the maintenance of those fittings and it generated completely as going back to your light bulb story uh, completely different set of incentives now exist around that um, that example so Philips are incentivized to make it as energy efficient as possible they're incentivized to design the fittings and the light bulbs etc to be as durable as long as just last as long as possible um, they're designed to design the, to make sure the office, the you know, the lighting in the office is as efficient as possible. So you don't even need to use uh, the lights as much. Um, and that and that you know that model has been applied to ship or airport and various other places as well. So that is a great example of a performance economy when you want the performance rather than the thing itself. And performance economy is one of the things that has inspired the circular economy. So where does circular economy get other inspiration sources of inspiration? It's funny, the, the term performance economy um, comes from Walter Stahl, who first spoke about a um, the concept of an economy in loops in the 1970s, um, and sort of coined that maybe is credited with coining the term of circular economy. I had the pleasure to um, see Walter recently, or actually I filmed an interview between him and Ellen MacArthur, and she asked him the question, um, you know, where, uh, is the circular economy a new idea or something along those lines? And... Uh, and his answer sort of stuck with me because he said, the circular economy has always existed in nature. Nature has always done the circular mm -hmm. economy, um, which uh, which is true. There is no waste in nature. Everything is food of something else in nature. Um, but uh, the circular economy, as we know it today, is, is built from a number of different sort of thinkers. It synthesizes a number of ideas. It synthesizes um, cradle to cradle thinking from William McDonough and Michael Braungart. Um, and that's where we derive notion which we'll talk about later of technological uh, technical and biological flows and the notion of doing um, not trying to do just less bad but more good um, it also derives inspiration from biomimicry which is a design concept which says what well, can specific designs be designed based on nature um, Walter Stahl's performance economy um, natural capitalism from Hunter, Hunter and Naomi Lovin so it's it's an idea that's um, accelerated rapidly in the last decade in terms of its usage but it's based in um, actually quite a long roots of schools of thought about uh, very you know, similar notions. Mm -hmm. And just to remind our listeners and those of you who have tuned in, if you have any questions throughout this conversation, you can put them down in our chat box and my colleague who's just behind the screens will pass it on to me and we'll make sure that we include them in the conversation. Nothing too difficult though. <laughs> I'm sure so, you can handle <laughs> any of them. Um, yeah, so all these inspirations for circular economy and so many different concepts coming together so if we were to distill all of them and we often talk about these principles so what are these principles all about so we talk about um, a circular economy being based on three principles um so maybe just talk through those one by mm -hmm. one design out waste and pollution yeah. um seems pretty important um and that basically says that look 
waste and pollution isn't like some sort of accidental thing that happens. It's actually the result of what we do in the design phase. Um, we estimate there are 80% of the sort of negative environmental impacts can be attributed to what happens in design. Um, so design that waste and pollution. Could you give an example yeah. of that? Um, so a story I really like, or um, I, my favourite circle of economy story, um, is uh, of Ecovative. And so um, Eben Bayer, who's an entrepreneur based in the United States, um, he and his business partner, partner were inspired to design this sort of alternative compostable packaging. And they saw um, uh, the way that mycelium, mycelium, which is the roots of mushrooms, were binding together wood chips. Um, and they decided to try and mimic that process, which comes back to the inspired by nature point. Um, and, uh, and they did it with uh, the byproducts of agriculture, so the parts of plants that aren't suitable for feed or food. Um, and they put it for a process that lasts a few days to shape and grow these this sort of packaging that replace, can replace polystyrene and other types of functions that are similar. Um, and it's compostable in your home, so when you're mm -hmm. done with it, you can put it out in the garden. Um, but but that, that product inherently, there is no waste designed into it. Its end of life is considered before it leaves uh, the company. So design out waste and pollution principle number one, and what is the principle number two? Keep products and materials in use and at the highest value to use for as long as possible. Um, so the idea that actually we're designing for durability, for longevity, that we have business models that circulate valuable materials and products um, between people or between functions. Um, a great example of that um, that I like is Gerard Street, and a couple of Dutch, again Dutch entrepreneurs who um, who basically uh, they were music fans, I think, and uh, they said, "Well, we get through so many headphones." Um, which I guess if you're a music lover, I'm not personally a massive listener to music, but if you're a music lover and you get through a lot of headphones, um, these guys are worth checking out. And they said, why do we have to just, you know, get a pair of headphones, throw them out, a new, new set or whatever they wear out or there's something cooler or better coming out. Um, so they designed Gerard Street, which is designed to be the circular audio experience. And uh, Gerard Street is a completely modular set of headphones. You get them in a box that's small enough that it fits through your letterbox. Um, and uh, when you get them out, you can unpack them and you just subscribe to them. You never own them. You can't buy them. And so you pay, a, a, I think it's a 10 euro subscription fee instead of buying an expensive set of headphones. Any single part you have that malfunctions, you can send back to the company and they'll replace it. And so they're incentivized to design them to be as durable as possible. At the end of the use of, you know, if the whole headphones are un un unusable, you just send them back and get a new set or if new features are added and stuff like that. Actually, we do have a, a pair of Jared Street headphones here in the office and wow. they come in this really thin box and it's quite incredible. They're packed really thinly and then you have to assemble them yourself, which is quite exciting. And yes, the sound quality was pretty good. So When, yeah. when I met them, they said that they're, so they're, currently, they're currently in the Netherlands. I believe they're just recently or soon to be um, available in some other countries, including the UK. Yeah. And one of their big challenges, funny enough, was uh, how do you design the packaging to be able to fit through letter boxes? Yes. Because letter boxes apparently vary immensely from country to country. Yes. Who knew? Yes. But um, but not insurmountable for Gerard Street. Mm. Right. So that was principle number two: keep products in use for longer. And principle number three is uh, regenerate natural systems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this notion that, that the concept of waste actually doesn't exist in nature. Everything is food for something else. Um, uh, the cradle to cradle pioneers, they always give the example of the cherry tree, uh, produces way more blossom than it can ever need to reproduce itself. But the, you know, so there's a lot of waste in a cherry blossom tree, but actually it, it fits into the system. Um, and uh, I know that uh, there's, um, there's another one, another thinker that we engage with quite regularly called Lisa Garmelovic. She talks about this idea that um, actually in nature there's huge volumes of materials, um, way higher volumes of materials than plastics, for example, which we already talked about as being one that's problematic in the, in the, in the environment. But of course, they're, they're, they all have a function, they all have a place to go, and they all cycle. Um, good example. Uh, there are a number of great examples of regenerative natural systems, especially in the world of agriculture, that mm -hmm. maybe people want to hear about, we can talk about later. One that I've personally experienced or like had a personal impact on me was um, a chance to visit Venlo City Hall in, in the Netherlands, um, which is a building that is it was specifically designed to be 
it was actually still designed to meet cradle to cradle certifications, um, but the materials were chosen as health and safety materials. The space was designed to sort of self ventilate. They have um, various plants and crops growing, especially on their north facade. But actually, the experience of because actually we, it was a, a trip that we took with uh, I think that's uh, one of our business workshops, and, um, and we're going to see this circular building, this cradle to cradle building. And of course, as you drive up to it, it actually just looks like a a building like it's not going to look exceptionally different i mean you know but, it, so, very but um, it purifies the air in a oh, 500 wow. meter radius around the building so actually as you get out of the car and walk toward this building you can actually and, and inside it's the same feeling it actually feels different so even though the you know your, your eyes tell you it just looks like a normal building a normal office in some ways mm. um your other senses really pick up on the fact that this is very different from some of the other things that you might experience this similar. This sounds incredible because air pollution is such a big problem, especially in the big, in the big cities. Why do you think we don't have more examples like that? Um, well, I think that um, there was a very ambitious... Well, I think, firstly, in that particular city, there's a desire for all the uh, all buildings to be designed with a similar set of principles so that the city council is taking on. Um, and I think that that's a very ambitious, pioneering activity and there are other replications of it Arapa built a circle, what they call a circular building in, in London which was you know designed with a similar similar concepts or similar considerations and was demonstrated in London um, so you know I, th I think that those those concepts are being developed um, obviously one of the big challenges for any project like that is how do you go from designing one big building to uh, matching the sort of scale that, that those markets have mm. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Great. Yes, thank you for your question. So, today a circular economy is a competitive advantage and tomorrow it will be a competitive necessity. How long do you predict it will take for companies to transition? And are there any examples of the companies that have that are fully committed? Global so, partners? Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I don't like to get too much into predictions of, of timelines. Um, because I don't know enough. But I think what's really interesting about that question is that um, companies are recognizing already that it's a competitive advantage today, let alone the 10 to 15 year outlook, which, um, which you know, in terms of short term profits within their businesses or short term brand positioning or whatever it might be, there's a huge amount of value in engaging with the circular economy already and positioning your business uh, for longer term success based on the context of finite materials based on the context of environmental regulations and environmental challenges. Um, there are a number of companies who have unveiled um, targets that say sort of 100% circular. They might not exactly know how they're going to get there, but they said our ambition by 2025, our ambition by 2030 is to be 100% circular. Could you name a few? Uh, so H&M. Mm -hmm. um, I think Philips have come out with a similar um, hitch. Um, so They've, they, you know, they they don't have a path, but they've said our strategy is circular economy. That's what we're going to get to, and I think that's quite inspirational. Um, there are other companies that are saying this is a really critical thing. Can we demonstrate in some way in our business? Um, can we um, show it in a lighthouse type project? Um, and there, you know, there, there are a number of examples of that in play already. There's the Adidas um, shoe that we got to see actually recently at our at the foundation summit um, that's been designed uh, and is CTC certified and is a shoe on the marketplace. So I can't remember the name of that shoe, unfortunately. Sorry. Future, no, future proof, future yes, something like that. Something yes, like future. that, yes, yes. Yes. So yes, so we do have companies already that are fully committed to circular economy and implementing circular economy. Do you know of any companies that are already fully circular? I don't know of any company already that is fully circular. And why is that? a large company. Um, I think that what we talked about a little bit earlier around the incentives and the challenges of shifting within the linear economy. So right now the world is linear. And so for a company to you know, be able to say it's 100% circular, then you've got to consider a supply chain, you've got to consider the whole value chain that sits around that company and that's extremely challenging. Um, there's also the challenge that actually it's quite difficult with a number of these issues for any single company to do something by themselves. Um, you know, take for example the fashion industry where only 1% of clothing is currently recycled back into new clothing. 
no company in the fashion sector has more than a couple of percent of the market. Um, so they're really incentivized actually to collaborate together and to work together to create a new system that sits around that industry and that material flow that works. That's what we do with, um, well, that's what our make fashion sector in systemic initiative aims to do. And they have just released a new initiative, something about jeans, jeans right? Yeah, so they've taken a really iconic project, uh, product, jeans. And we're both, we wearing, both, wear we're jeans. both wearing jeans. Is, are your jeans circular? Uh, I, don't I don't think, think my so. Jeans are circular. I've had them for a long time. Um, yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so they've taken an iconic product like jeans, they've brought together some of the really big players in, in that particular sector, and they said, can we create some guidelines that uh, that a number of genes would be redesigned, a percentage of that organization's gene would be redesigned to buy and deliver into the market by, I think it's 2021. You'll have to check the final date on that one, but um, exactly so saying, can we take one product, look at everything that sits around that, the materials that go into it, the uh, the way in which it's sold, the, uh, the way in which it's collected, and those materials are then reused or recycled or um, repurposed in whatever way. Um, and can we um, can we design genes on the marketplace that are circular genes? And, and actually, that, what I should say about that project is that that's also started with this is the minimum. This is the minimum we need to get to. So mm-hmm. uh, the expectation is that actually many of the companies involved in the project are already trying to push those guidelines further, uh, or trying to push the standards further, which is you know, just so really positive. demonstrating their commitment. Okay, let's see what else do we have in the questions. So are there clear financial gains or is it still about doing good? <clears throat> How does the argument of let's do more good work for companies? So, I mean, there's a couple, there's a couple of angles on that. One is that, um, and I recently heard um, quite a senior executive say this, that the brands that are doing good are also doing good, are also um, making more money. Um, so there's a huge brand incentive around profits in terms of, at least being perceived to do good or trying to do good. In many cases, there's already a really strong economic argument for, there are certainly challenges, but there's already a strong economic argument for shifting. So um, Renault's remanufacturing plant, Choisy Loire, is their most prof- is the most profitable part of the business, the best margins in their business. So there are a number of examples where it is already financially beneficial. Um, and what was the other part of that question? Is it either clear, fin- either clear financial gains or is it just about doing good? And just also adding to that is that in my recent conversations with companies, and I had quite a few with them, it's so circular economy as idea is something that really inspires them because it's something that addresses the current issues in the world. But at the same time, when it comes to making the decisions and moving towards more circular solutions, that bottom line, the financial benefit needs to be demonstrated and needs to be there. But as you say, in quite a few cases, circular solutions can show that they're more beneficial than the linear ones. And it's also about looking at that slightly longer term picture and saying that things are changing, the market will change. And there's a cost to, there's certainly a cost of acting at times. Um, there, there may be a cost associated with trying to change your business model so that you're now selling something on a lease or a rent or whatever model versus, um, you know, versus, uh, you know, selling outright. There's also a cost of inaction. Um, there's a cost of inaction that you will pay over a period of time if you don't, if, if com- the companies that aren't already moving on this. And I think that's recognised by companies. And there's also businesses that are, are growing and becoming very large for a circular. The Real Real um, recently, um, at another one of our events, announced they want to become the first $1 billion circular com- economy company. And that's a significant, um, you know, significant resale um, fashion uh, company that's working with a number of really big brands already in the US. Tino Balbo Jr. is a sugarcane farmer in Brazil. Um, he, uh, he apparently spent like 10 years in the forest thinking about his farm. His, his family had this big farm in Brazil. And he completely changed the way that they did it. They removed all fertilizers and pesticides from the farm. He, um, he, allowed, he allowed biodiversity like is not normally common in farms. It's actually more uh, species and all native fauna on his farm than there are uh, than there are in some more diversity than there are in some of Brazil's national parks. Um, and that business is the, the I think has 30% or something of the organic sugarcane market in the world. It's the largest organic sugarcane farm uh, distribution in the world um, 
it's a big supplier for green and blacks the famous sort of global brand um so and so his business is his yields in his business are vastly more profitable than they were before he adopted this sort of regenerative agriculture approach and now I'm looking at the questions and there is another question that brings us back to more technological solutions than technological items. And I wonder if at this point it would be worth talking a little bit about our butterfly diagram and yes. the two cycles that we separate. And I think my colleague will be putting on screen the butterfly diagram so you should be able to see. It. So the butterfly so diagram is a nice way of visualizing, visualizing the circular economy. Um, so it shows two sides. Um, a technical side and a biological side, which we take from cradle to cradle. And it shows a number of different loops on each side. So on the technical side, the innermost loop is uh, sharing, and then you have reuse and refurbishment, remanufacturing. And you still have this loop of last resort of recycling. And what those inner loops have is the most amount of, in, they keep the most amount of embedded um, labor and energy that went into the product initially. So sharing is just moving one product to the other. So for example, the Toronto Tool Library in Canada, they have a subscription service, they have 7,000 tools and people can access those. And that replaces um, someone owning a drill, but I think the stat is that people, the average person uses their drill for like less than 10 minutes in this lifetime. For me, I'm probably still on like one or two minutes. <laughs> um, but uh, so you have that, so that's the most value because actually that's just transportation of that good from to someone else and then you have things like reuse where there may be some cleaning involved and you have refurbishment and remanufacturing where there's some other kind of process that needs to be applied to make that as a new and then you have recycling which involves the most amount of um, energy etc going into turning that material back into a new material and on the other side you have the biological cycle which is really about how do we return nutrients back to the soil back to the environment how do we do um, more good and not less bad. So looking at the technical cycle, so the idea is to keep within the inner or closer loops as much as possible, right? Exactly, so the most value is on those inner loops. And what's what I think is quite interesting maybe for a business or a designer is to look at where their products might be on those loops, loops to, to place themselves where the opportunity is. Some products are very suitable for, there's a real opportunity in sharing, some are more suitable for reuse, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually, as an exercise, kind of, look at where your opportunity might be by looking at those, looking at that part of flood. Mm -hmm. So again, looking back at the questions, and this brings us out to the larger context, context. So how much do we need to change, to focus on changing the behaviors and attitudes, and how much to focus on technologies and enabling technologies? How much to focus on Attitudes. Attitudes versus enabling technology. So maybe we could separate these two questions to begin with. So technology and how technology can enable circular economy. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, interestingly, we talked about linear economy, we talked about industrial revolution, technology enabled change. The circular economy, and that's what enabled us to, you know, something about this throughput scale model. In some ways, the circular economy is similarly linked to a technological revolution, the digital revolution, the ability of um, to be able to track things like never before, before the ability to digest data like never before. Um, so I think a huge number of these technologies are, are enablers of the circular economy in order to do the circular economy effectively, to be able to recover your products effectively, to be able to, um, to uh, servitize your products effectively, utilizing this new set of technologies, a, a lot of those are like critical to it and future you know when you look at the four and you know many organizations like the world economic forum are uh, very strongly advertising the idea of the fourth industrial revolution um when you look at those things uh, when you look at that is it obviously uh, as that develops that's um a preferred enabler so what can AI, what does ai mean for the future of certain things um so i think Technology is a key enabler. I guess that actually the idea of like designing out waste, keeping products and materials in use, generating natural systems is somewhat, somewhat agnostic towards technology. Um, but uh, but in order to do those things, especially maybe keeping materials and products in use, um, you have to utilize things like Internet of Things, AI. Very especially powerful. as technology is becoming so much more pervasive in our own lives, and we can do everything on our phones basically, and. Instead of having a car, we can just get the It changes your relationship yes. with your customer. 
Yes, exactly. So talking about the customers and then and their behaviors and their mindset. So how much beha- customers' behaviors or consumers' behavior have an influence on circular economy and where it's moving? Um, so I think there's it's a two-way um, conversation because actually, in many ways, the circular economy solutions need to be better solutions for customers. Um, you know, they need to be a more attractive proposition if, if people are going to really rent their clothes, etc. It can't just be that we're persuading customers to do something different because they want to do more good. It also has to be that actually that has some kind of benefit to them. But I think that um, increasingly, and, the, and companies are flagging this, there's a greater demand in two, two big areas. One is buying habits, owning habits. People live in cities, for example. Do they want to own cars? And that really is a huge opportunity for circling models. Um, and there's also a, a social environmental consciousness that exists within the customers who are coming into the marketplace. Um, I don't like to use the term like younger generations because it's not mm. really a helpful distinction in many ways, but there's no question that the at, at a massive scale, the buying habits of people entering the marketplace who are in millennial generation set and um, consumers, they have different expectations of the companies and brands that they buy from. Um, and, and, and as we would describe, they're very much digitally enabled. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's see what else we have. We have quite a few questions. It's worth saying that um, also that our mm-hmm. research um, demonstrates a massive economic opportunity for, related to the circular economy. You know, we haven't done a huge amount of like company by company financing, but our reports and whether they you know, originally we found a $1 trillion opportunity attached to Europe, for example. Um, we have similar large number of opportunities for the economies of India and China. Um, so, and, you know, there's a, there's a huge material value savings in, in switching to a new plastics economy versus inspired by circular economy principles versus the linear model. So there's the, I think there's a kind of awareness of the macroeconomic opportunity attached to it. Um, which is also why collaboration and the relationships between organisations and companies and policymakers play such a huge role. So if I was, if I heard this fact as a listener that there is this huge economic opportunity when it comes to circular economy in the world, I would think, okay, so if I wanted to start a business, maybe I should make sure that my business is circular. How can I do that? If I want to start a circular startup or a business, how to do that? how to make sure it's circular. So I think um, there's a load of useful resources that can that now exist on the interweb that can help people to start thinking about whether it's designing something, whether it's servitizing a business. We've got our um, circular design guide website that has enormous amount of um, resources for people, either whether it's, whether it's a mindset piece. So there's a load of stuff there about how do you think differently? How do you start to look at circular economy flows and materials? Um, so I think the mindset shift is quite important. Uh, it's about going back to thinking and designing differently, not thinking about how you can use some waste at the end of, of a product that's designed badly. Um, and, and there's also methods and techniques you can actually use to start um, designing businesses or products or services differently. Circular Design Guide, do you remember the website? Circular, www.circulardesignguide.com. Dot com, great. Um, yes, yeah, so thinking differently, piece, and I guess when I think, what would be the circular way of thinking? So definitely the principles come into mind. So how we can redesign out waste and pollution, how we can keep products and materials in use and how we can make sure that whatever new that we create regenerates natural systems. But also the butterfly diagram comes back in mind as well. Like how can I make sure that I can reuse whatever I create or then share it or then make sure that it's repairable and then refurbished and recycling becomes as a very last step and hopefully never reaching back to landfill. Yeah. And and the importance of the separation between the biological and technical yes. aspects, which um, one of the sort of challenges within many of the products we've done today is the challenge of actually extracting the materials, separating the materials that are within products um, in a mobile phone, for example, there's um, several rare earth elements. There's more gold per ton in a mobile phone than there is in gold ore, um, but it's designed in such a way that actually none of those things can be released. And maybe at a scale where it's, it's, um, there's a challenge in terms of the incentive, but those parts, many of which are uh, have very different lifespans um, and, and 
that come out to date quickly, but still functioning materials work. Um, you know, they're, they're designed in a way they can't be put through those loops. Yeah. So it seems that the more materials you put together and melt together, the harder it is then to separate them and reuse them or recycle them, both in textiles and plastics and things like that. No. Okay, let's see what else do you have. So we have quite a few questions about measuring circularity. Great, I love talking about measuring about the circular economy. So measuring circular economy. It's a very important topic. Yes. So basically the question is, what does it mean to be fully circular? How do we know that something is 100% circular? And the answer is that we don't know. Um, but... Uh, that that is a really important area of exploration. Uh, oh, exploration, exploration. We um, at the Anna MacArthur Foundation released something called Circularity Indicators several years ago, which look at how do you assess the progress in your product from zero to one. You know, how do you assess from zero circularity to being circular? And it's within a number of factors. You know, the recyclability, the durability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, I think that's a tool that's still available on our website that you can score a product on. Um, we more intensely, the foundation recognise the importance of companies um, and startups and organisations being able to assess where they are on a circular economy journey and the value of being actually able to track that. And that is that's something that we're actively working on. Um, there are a couple other um, measures out there or people working on the topic, um, but because it's a new idea and because there's some complexity to um, assessing it, uh, it's a new piece of work. But we will have work on that and um, I think the other thing that we do in that area is that so for example in the world of plastics again last year we unveiled our global commitment which is a commitment that companies that produce plastic packaging sign up to to a set of commitments so one of the commitments for example is to design all your packaging to be 100% reusable recyclable or compostable by 2025 um, and those companies are now locked into a reporting process where they share data on progress towards those different objectives um, over the course of the global commitments. So um, there are some specific things that you could, you know, that you wouldn't say that if those companies are necessarily 100% circular once they achieve those commitments, but there's some specific things you can track. And there's also this wider question of how do we assess how circular a product or a company, a sector is. Yes, and from my own work with companies, the need to measure and know how far you advance or to have the indicators, the performance indicators in place is one of the necessary enabling conditions in order to advance and transition towards more circular solutions as well. Okay, what else do we have? Can fast fashion be an example of a leader in the circular economy, <coughs> though they are overproducing and pushing up the consumption by design? Um, I think um, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about the world of fashion for one thing it's an incredibly inventive innovative and inspiring industry that really connects in very directly to people and their their personal sense of who they are and, and so I think it there's a huge opportunity there um, our work at, uh, with Make Fashion Circular looks at kind of three areas to focus on around the world of fashion one is the inputs you know can we make the inputs the material choices healthy and safe and um, clean. Um, how do we use different business models? You know, what, what do people really want? Do they want access to the clothes, the, the, the scale of the wardrobe, or do they need to own loads of clothes they never wear? And, and what's the business opportunity in there? And also looks at, you know, how do we collect and get these things back? How do we incentivize people's behavior to recover those materials so they can be, so we can improve on that 1% of clothing being recycled um, back into new clothes. So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, that actually fashion is a too inventive an industry to be trapped in a linear model. Mm. And there is, a, in a way, a similar question. I'm just going to read it as it is. Why, <laughs> why are so many of the most heavy polluters from the recent past? And the, for instance, Unilever, are we to believe that they're becoming aware or accountable? So I guess... For me, the larger question here is that the situation in the world right now, you could say that business is part of the problem or it's the per perpetrator of the problem. So are we to believe that business can also be the solution? Um, 
So I think that um, we talk about the circle, I mean, very explicitly as being an industry-led transformation. That's not to say that policymakers and institutions and individuals don't play important roles. Um, and we talk about that because of their breadth. So large companies um, have uh, placed all over the world. Um, and if you can shift some of these really big players, you can have a massive influence on the marketplace. The global commitment has launched had 20% of all plastic packaging volume signed up to it. Um, and that's why we choose to, that's why we personally work with those companies, that's why we highlight when they do positive things, because there's so much impact with working with that end of the of the chain, that part of the part of the system. Okay. It's also why uh, measurement is such an important exactly. factor again, right? Yeah. Because there's an element of transparency and accountability that also, um, like, you know, maybe the people who are, maybe the person who's asked that question or the people who ask those, ask those sorts of questions are after, you know. Yes, and, and again, uh, what I have heard a lot from companies is that in order to be, there's definitely an ambition to become more circular and there's a recognition that to be more circular, you need to be more transparent and more collaborative. And that also sometimes means to start working with the companies that you wouldn't have considered working before. So they are willing to change their ways and because circular economy is in a sense, future-proofing their businesses, right? <laughs> As we, uh, <laughs> I personally really dislike the term future-proof. So I think the only way to future-proof yourself is basically to cease to exist. That's the only way you can really be proofed against the future. But I think what I, what I think inspires uh, action around the circle is that when, it's not about asking an organisation to make a massive sacrifice. Um, I think uh, a lot. There's a lot of headlines. There's a lot of news. There's a lot of advice or, or guidance out there that's talking about. What can, can you do less? Can you have less? Can you use less? Can you own less? Um, circular economy is actually is framed and is a sort of a solution, a vision. You know that we the problems are well advertised and and um, in many ways uh, all around us or highlighted all around us. But what the question is, you know, what's the solution and what's the goal? Where are we working towards? And that's I think that's why uh, you see such high levels of engagement and why I'm more hopeful about that and optimistic about the levels of engagement of big companies and startups and governments and, and all other players in the system because it's we're working towards a goal we've got a vision we've got a um, a solution to those macro challenges so you mentioned the governments so what is the role of the governments and policy in transitioning towards circular government um so we work with policy on a number of levels and it's worth remembering that policy works at a number of different levels there's a eu circular economy package that obviously works across the entire all the eu states there's national level policy there's city level policy there's local municipal i'm not going to say it can you say it <laughs> no, don't try there's lots of different levels of policy and um municipal and thank you and uh and the role, and what we talk about actually there is the role of um, policy sort of enabling the right and incentivizing the right kinds of business practice. Um, we have a number of policy levers that highlight the opportunities for that, specifically for cities. That's um, in the circular economy of cities section of our website. Um, and, and yeah, and, and, there, and there is a really strong opportunity, especially perhaps at a city level, for. Um, for policy to play a really good role in activating and inspiring and um, creating a really fertile ground for innovation and stuff probably space. So thinking about the circular economy all over the world, are there any regions that stand out and is it equally implemented in different regions or are some regions ahead and some regions behind? Um, I Yeah, so the, the, it, the, it looks and feels different based on the context of the region. Um, so the idea has recently become very focused in, in Western Europe and the EU, where uh, material finiteness and the importance of important materials or dependence on imports of materials has really strongly felt that closeness. Um, it's, there's actually been a circular economy policy in place in China since the late 1990s, um, and that at the moment has been very strongly focused on, um, on uh, I guess, the not as much on the design phase of so the importance of the role of design, but still um, very much encompasses many of the principles of the circular economy. Um, and, and there's emerging interest in different regions all around the world. Um, it looks and feels different 
wherever it is, I think. Um, there's a, obviously a, a growing, we, we work in Latin America and there's a, there's a growing interest in innovation in that area, especially around social entrepreneurship. Um, there's a number of really exciting examples. Um, there's a, well, actually a very big company, uh, one of the, the world's largest B Corp. Um, B Corps, because anyone doesn't know, are companies that are not um, on the stock exchange, so they're not motivated by purely on the sales by sales linear model that. Um, that so it's an accreditation are. system. Exactly. Um, so it's an, you know, an organisation you sign up to. And one of the largest of those is Natura, who have produced these um, this toiletry. Um, Use toiletries and the packaging is designed with single materials so it can be recaptured and, and uh, either reused or recycled very easily. And what about the circular economy in the third world countries? Um, so the there's that we've we've done a piece of research in India which specifically really looked at the social advantage of pairing sort of circular economy with the development path that they're on. Um, the circular, I mean, and, and there are examples of circular economy in, in those countries. Um, there's some notion that actually in some, in, the, in many of those economies, um, whether you call them third world or developing or um, whatever terminology you use, um, but there's some notion that uh, they can actually leapfrog some of the development paths that other countries have gone through. They don't, they're not weighed down by the infrastructure or the, uh, they're not as locked into the linear economy as, as, Say we are in the UK or in, in Western Europe. Um, so, so there are there are there's it's clearly an opportunity for entrepreneurship. Um, there are obviously additional challenges uh, based on the the economic wealth of the areas, um, and it's also an area of emerging research. I think. So we talked about the economic benefits of this of the circular economy on different levels, but what about the environmental or social benefits of this? Yeah, the circular economy. Um, so, alongside the uh, big headline numbers around economic opportunity. There's always been these numbers that highlight significant benefits in CO2 emissions, CO2 cuts. Um, we speak about it being perhaps the, lo the, you know, the forgotten low carbon vector. There's uh, a lot of focus on um, shifting energy, but what does it mean to, um, to use materials in a different way? Um, and, 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 and obviously, if you're keeping materials in use, you know, they're, not getting, they're not leaking into the environment if you're uh, putting them through the cycles of a circular economy, they're not ending up in our oceans, um, and, and so there's a huge. I think there's. I think it's there's a real strong consequential environment, environmental benefit, um, as well as that being often a, you know an inspiration for people to engage or design their business differently. Okay, so we have about ten minutes left until the end of this webinar, and we do have. Still quite a few questions. So Thank how you about, for your questions. Yes, people are tuning questions live. keep coming in. Um, so how I don't about this? think we're going to get to all of those, are we? No, we're not going to go through all of this, but what we're going to do, so I'm going to read you a question and you'll have, let's say, less than a minute to answer. So we'll be able to cover five, six, maybe seven. Let's see. Let's see how fast you can answer them and how far we can go through. Okay, so what is the relationship between circular economy and artificial intelligence? We have um, a couple of papers on this um, that uh, look at that topic, specifically one published with Google and McKinsey more recently. Um, they're available on our publications page. Essentially, what that paper looks at is um, the opportunity to pair artificial int intelligence and circular economy together as two trends and some of the explicit opportunities that are attached to that. Basically, artificial intelligence can be an explanation enabler of circular economy business models Circular economy can also provide a direction or, um, you know, positive movement for AI innovators. But check out the paper on the publications page because I can't fully answer that one. In, but in brief, it? it's a technological enabler. Of exactly. Circular economy. Um, in what are, oh, just moved, what are the biggest challenges for micro and small and medium enterprises when it comes to implementing circular economy? There's a, there's a number of really great examples of uh, some of the ones we've already given actually of small businesses that are already able to do circular economy. I mean, it's. Um, but what challenges do they face? So, you know, because actually the, the opportunity is that you're not locked into the linear model. I think a couple of the big challenges, especially are around finance, um, and and finance often depends on um, on the ability to demonstrate some sort of previous. Um, success of a model. So finance people don't tend to predict, or investors don't tend to predict, they tend to base on past experiences. 
um, recently um, saw an interview with uh, River Simple's founder, which is a, a hydrogen fuel cell powered um, car company that leases cars and it doesn't sell them. And he talks about the challenge of getting investment for a product that actually just competes at a completely different level where normal cars are sold based on the build costs. His car is sold based on lifetime costs and it's an asset that they keep on their books. Um, you know, so that's a big challenge in terms of convincing people to invest. That uh, River Simple, if people do want to find out more about that story, is also available in the case study section of our website. The case study section on our website. Okay. Is biodegradable packaging material a solution to the issues caused by plastic waste? Um, so there's some there's some like questions and debate around biodegradable and compostable in general. There are some definite definitely there are some um, formats where compostable or biodegradable packaging is um, is a really powerful solution. Um, for example, uh, Evoware in Indonesia, a company that turns um, what those little sachets of packaging, which are a huge challenge in Southeast Asia, and they make them out of seaweed, um, and so uh, you can have your ketchup sachet and you can just pop it into your it, mouth or, or or not and it will biodegrade pretty okay. in there. so there are definitely a, a number of formats where biodegradable are, are, is a clear solution this one is quite specific so some people think that one of the most appropriate tools to implement circular economy strategies is life cycle thinking do you recommend another some people think that one the most them. appropriate tools to implement circular economy strategies is life cycle thinking, um, I, life cycle assessment, or in general, yes, yeah. the life cycle. So how we can prolong the life cycle of a product? Yes, I mean, li I mean, life cycle thinking is a specific way of, you know, assessing or evaluating when you're designing or creating something or evaluating something that resists. Um, I don't have a specific recommendation for another. Um, I think that uh, our circularity indicators tool does that on an individual product basis. Um, and, and obviously more metrics and measurements are being, are being brought in all the time. That comes very much back to the measurement and metrics conversation we had earlier. Yeah. And, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge. And a lot of companies are facing that challenge and they're trying to figure out as we speak, so to speak, how to measure circularity and how to measure their progress towards it. You've got a circular strategy, but what's the... Exactly. What are you and tracking? When will you know that you're already out there, that you reached it? Yeah. Hmm. Great. What else do we have? How important is traceability in establishing circular loops? Traceability. I think this uh, T-shirt actually can be. This is this is uh, um, this T-shirt is made by Rapa Nui, who are based here on yes. the Isle of Wight. Yes. Um, they part of their company is called T-Mill, and it's actually for me it's one of the really strong examples of um, of a circular product in every sense because they work with farmers in northern India um, to source the organic cotton that's made ethic in an ethical way, but also. Um, you know, designed in a way that will farm in a way that's, that's sustainable and enriches soil. They then uh, produce on demand. Um, so they're not uh, having this problem of overstock, which is a huge challenge for um, for, for many fashion brands. Um, so they're producing based on demand, produce, uh, using latest technologies, using technology enablement. There's an incredible factory of robots and stuff um, that show you how they do it. Um, and then they uh, they always capture the guns back and part of that is um, in being able to trace and when they get the t-shirt back knowing what's in it yes and what i love about it is that actually with this little label i can send this t-shirt back when i'm tired of it or back. bored of it they want it back and then they will give me a credit of up to five pounds and then they will turn it into a new t-shirt which i think is pretty incredible and so we are approaching the end of our webinar so, Seth, if we were to leave our listeners with three things we want them to absolutely remember out of this webinar, what would these things be? For me, it's, um, this is about design. It's about going back to the beginning and designing differently. Um, and that's a really important mindset shift, um, I think, attached to the circular economy. Um, so it's about designing, whether it's designing your business model, whether it's designing your product, whether it's designing your system or sector or country or whatever it is it's about designing things differently from the beginning um the second one, the second one is um that there's an interconnect interconnect 
as the connected. connectedness. Yes, um, <laughs> that's easy for me to say. Um, and that, I guess that relates to thinking about the system, um, relates to the importance of collaboration. Um, that, there's, that it's very hard to look at things in isolation. Um, and the third is that the circular economy is a vision or a goal. It's something that, that gives us a, it's a solutions framework that's positive and optimistic um, versus being about sacrifice. So it all starts with a design. We live in an interconnected system and the system's thinking is needed and the circular economy provides us with a great vision for the future. And if I could add one call to action to this, it would be to invite you to present this idea, present the circular economy idea to three people that you think would find it really interesting or fascinating or relevant. So at the back of this webinar, please go out and find three people to talk about the ideas that you have heard today. And thank you so very much for joining me. It seems like you're a walking encyclopedia of circular economy knowledge. It's been absolutely fascinating to hear you talk and share your experience. That's and right. There's loads more to watch as well coming up. Yes, and if you really enjoyed the session, please know that next week our Disruptive Innovation Festival is going to take place and you will be able to tune in and watch many more sessions, quite a few of them hosted by Seb. And to find more information about that, you can go to thinkdiff.co. And as I said, this is the first live session of our Circular Economy webinar series. And there will be more sessions coming up. The next one will most likely be in November and more information will be presented on our website and our media, social media channels. So please stay tuned and you can, you can always check our website at www.ellenmacarthafoundation.org. And just to say that this webinar series is part of our circle economy education efforts and our newly published learning hub is online and you can learn more about circle economy, learn more about in depth what it is and also about such topics as circular economy in the city, circular economy and artificial intelligence, intelligence, food, fashion, how you can apply it within your businesses, and also how you can make a circular economy pitch. It's and a good can, place to go where, for wherever your questions were un left unanswered today. Yes, so if you still have burning questions, you can look for them on our learning hub. And you can find it at www ellenmacarthafoundation.org slash explore and we also love to hear your feedback and comments about how this session went so if you can type your comments in the chat box for us right now before we close the webinar and if there are any specific topics that you would like us to cover in our upcoming webinars you can type them in as well and we will take definitely take them into consideration and I think that will be all for today. Thank you very much for joining us. And we had an overwhelming amount of responses to join this webinar. So we're really excited to kick off the series. And yeah, that's it. You'll be able to watch the recording on our YouTube channel. And thank you for tuning in today. Have a great day wherever you are.